and Mark chapter 8. I'm sorry, Mark chapter 8. Now, this is going to, if you have a good memory, this message is going to probably, you're going to remember I've done this one recently, and I feel the Lord uh, said, hey, you got to hit it again. Now, if the Jeffers are slow learners, they just heard it about 30 minutes ago, so I don't know. <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay, I question people's sanity that uh, listen to me too much. <laughs> okay, Mark chapter nine or 8, um, and I hope it's uh, an encouragement blessing to you, even though it, it's been pretty recent. Okay, Mark eight twenty seven. Jesus went out and his disciples into the towns of Caesarea Philippi. And by the way, he asked his disciples, saying unto them, Whom do men say that I am? They answered, and they answered, John the Baptist, and some say Elias, and others one of the prophets. And he saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Peter answered, saith unto him, Thou art the Christ. And he charged them that they should tell no man of him. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected of the elders and of the chief priests and scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. And he spake that saying openly. So it was more than once he said this, but it just didn't register. Okay, and Peter took him and began to rebuke him. But when he had turned about and looked on his disciples, he rebuked Peter saying, Get thee behind me, Satan. For thou savorest not the things that be of God, but the things that be of men. And when he had called the people unto him with his disciples also, he said unto them, Whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. And whosoever will save his life shall lose it. But whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and the gospels, the same shall save it. For what uh, shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he cometh in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Okay, let's go ahead and pray. Lord, I do ask you to help us to understand this idea, help us recognize that there are going to be some things in life that Uh, can shake our faith. And sometimes our faith needs shook because it may not be right in certain areas. And Lord, I do pray that you'd help us to understand this truth and help us to be encouraged when uh, things uh, don't go as we thought they should or desired or planned. Help us to understand your words in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, back through the storyline Okay, the, the Lord has told the disciples that uh, he's going to suffer. Okay, now, in their mind, that didn't register. Now, if you drop down to verse 34, when he tells this story right after this event, this story is helping to explain something previous. Peter is the one that he's uh, been talking to. So in verse 34, it has three things where it says, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. So there's three things there, okay? And if this is starting to ring a bell from what I preached earlier, I hope that's fine. So there's a take up your cross, there's a denying of yourself, and then you follow Jesus Christ, And so these two ideas, taking up your cross and denying yourself, originate in one of two fashions, okay? One is in an involuntary fashion, uh, operating under the will of God, and the other is a fashion that you and I should exercise ourselves, denying ourselves, okay? I'll explain this further and then bring it into the family structure as we get down through this, okay? And... The concept or the idea of the crucifixion was foreign to the apostles. Okay, so when you read down through, uh, we get an insight into the personality of Jesus when he asked the disciples, who do the people say that I am? Well, John the Baptist, Elias, Amos, so forth, so on. So if you look at those guys, you kind of see the personality of Jesus. 
And then he said, well, who do you say I am? And Peter said, you're the Christ, you're the Messiah, you're the king, you're, that's who you are. And then that's what they understood under the Old Testament doctrine. Remember, they did not know anything about the church, right? They didn't know anything about the church. All those Jews knew about was that the king's coming to set up his kingdom. And Jesus was letting them know, before you get your crown, you have to suffer. Now, that was foreign to them. And it did not register. Okay, and he said that multiple times. And so uh, it, it didn't register with them, even to the point after he rose from the dead. <clears throat> from the dead. And Acts chapter 1, the apostles still said, are you giving us the kingdom? Okay, because they didn't know anything about the church time period. They didn't know anything about him suffering, even though Psalms 22 is a pretty right, in, right obvious psalm. Okay, and so what it was, it was going against a Jewish viewpoint. Now, there are going to be some things that you and I believe from the Bible, but there's going to be some things in your life that's going to go against what you think. And that becomes a cross. And how we deal with that is going to be observed by the Lord. A lot of times, we're not responsible for the actions of what other people do to us. But we are responsible for our reaction. Moses was not responsible for the griping, murmuring Jews. But he was responsible and held accountable for hitting the rock when Jesus, God told him to speak to it. He was held accountable for that. And it says Moses was the meekest man on earth, and he lost his temper. You talk about some people that pushed you to the limit. Okay, and so the idea of this, so I'm trying to get across, is that Paul told us that we have to die daily. First Corinthians. So there are some things in a, a life of a believer we have to voluntarily, purposely set aside or delay some things in our lives. And then there's some crosses in our lives. Okay, and everybody's got different ones. And then the, if you see somebody's carrying the same cross that you have, then you two can get together and try to uh, overcome this cross or take it up and serve God with it. Okay, now the context of this is not salvation, it's dealing with growth or it's dealing with walking with God. The idea of taking up your cross refers to an involuntary origination of the cross, meaning it is in God's realm, okay, where it's something outside of our control. The idea of denying yourself is something that you and I can control. We can decide to do it or not. Okay, and so uh, Peter is admonished, take up his cross. In other words, he's saying to Pete, you need to accept the idea that I'm going to suffer. Now, that didn't register. And when Jesus told those guys to get a sword, a couple swords, they got a couple of them, in Peter's mind, oh, he is going to get his kingdom because you see that truth of denying yourself or taking up a cross had not bore any fruit yet. And so he's thinking, oh, good, I am going to get to bear this sword. And so when that night came where he could, yeah, he ripped, whipped that sword out, and he was going to sever that guy's head off, and the guy ducked somehow, got his ear, okay, and then Jesus put it back on, and then, and then he said, Pete, put it back. And that really threw him for a loop, and that's why he got mad at God. It went against his Jewish upbringing. It went against some of the doctrines that he was taught, now, there are some things in our lives doctrinally that aren't against the Bible, but they are strange or outside of our realm. Okay, we've had Bill Sneblin here on several occasions, and he's had some woo-hoo weird adventures that I'm glad I've never experienced. And when you tell some of these stories, you kind of scratch your head. Now, they're not contrary to the scriptures, but it's just not normal. And so then the Lord's kind of like, okay, how are you going to handle these things? Okay, and you say, well, he's lying. Well, that's his problem if he is. It's not mine, but I'm responsible for handling some of these things, even though it may not fit in my little uh, theological mold. And so I'm going to give you a couple thoughts this morning. The first one is about taking up your cross. Okay, this is the 
Uh, I would dare say that the greatest involuntary demonstration of this is Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. In Mark chapter 14, remember there was obviously a difference there because Jesus said, not my will but thine. So there's a little cross in there, or a big cross, where what was Jesus, the Lord Jesus in Mark 14, uh, bothered by people say, well, he's uh, you know upset about the crucifixion. He's upset about no that that had he had no bearing on him. He wasn't afraid of death. He wasn't afraid of the mob, uh, the mob scene taking place. What seemed to bother him was bearing this cup for sin. Okay, and if if I can get out of bearing this broken fellowship with my father, if there's another way we can go through this. Okay, let's see if we can figure it out. But then the Lord complied with God's will. The Father's will as far as taking up his cross, um, uh, taking up, up the wrath of God, broken fellowship with God the Father, and first time ever, and all that. So he accepted that idea, even though, you see, a cross develops when you got one going this way is vertical, up and down, and then man is going this way, horizontal, according to the plane of the earth, where it's straight across there. And so the cross is this way. And so according to this horizontal thing, the Lord said, not my will. My will is kind of go this route, but your will is going this route. And there are some in our own lives where we're going this route, and God says, well, I want you to check out this way. And so how are we going to handle that? Okay, now with the Apostle Paul, he told Paul, the reason why I saved you is, one, for salvation, but two, I called you to show you to suffer. Show you to suffer. That was Paul's calling. Boy, isn't that encouraging? What's your calling in life? Suffer. Boy, uh, let's hang out the phone and get a different number here. That's what he told Paul. And that's, then Paul turned around and told the people in Corinth, I want to teach you save Jesus Christ and... Him crucified. That's what he said to the people in Corinth. So this idea is thrown out there. This is not something you hear on the Christian television. They're not going to talk about this. Now, a lot of times they'll talk about a crown. Now, they think they're going to get the crown here. The Bible says the crown's there, but you ain't getting a crown there unless you take up the cross here. But what is this cross thing? Okay, and so this, this world system is against God. Obvious, right? It's against uh, trying to live right. As a believer, you're living right, you're swimming upstream. If you're going along with the stream, that's usually what dead fish do. Is they flip upside down and then they go downstream. So we're going upstream against the world system. And as we're going upstream against the world system, there's going to be fish that's going to be bumping into us. And we are going to be reaping some things because since Adam, 6,000 years, there are just some things you and I are going to reap. Why? Because we're living on this earth. And as a believer, there are some things that's going to happen to us. It's just because you're saved. And you don't get a persecution against me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's how it is. That is life. A guy will ask me, how's the world treating you? And, I, and I'll just sit straight up and say, terrible. And it catches them off guard. But the Lord's treating me okay and good. <laughs> and then that catches them off guard. Okay, and so here's how this present evil wor system worked. Abel was murdered. He had no plans for that. <laughs> okay, Jacob and Esau squabbled amongst themselves. Joseph's brothers betrayed him and sold him. That was, that was something outside of his plans for life. He never thought that was going to happen. Okay, um, you have Moses, who had a delayed calling. You have David, who was anointed to be king in 1 Samuel 16. And then what happens? He gets his picture taken and thrown in a post office. The picture's in a post office because he becomes a fugitive. That, I'm sure when he was out there in the woods, he's saying, I think I got a wrong connection in here somehow. There's no way am I going to be king. And then he did what he did all through that time period. That was against his thinking. That was a cross that he was bearing. Daniel and his buddies. 4,600 Jews were taken from uh, Judah to Babylon. And we only know the name of five or six of them. 
Daniel's three buddies and Ezekiel. What happened about all the others? I don't know. The Lord chose not to use them. But boy, was Daniel shocked. He was kidnapped. He was mutilated. Uh, no hope for him to ever have a family. Uh, that was the cross that he bore. Terrible cross. Now, there's crosses in life that are outside of our control. Everybody's got a little something different where it kind of goes contrary to our thinking. In the American mindset, okay, in our mindset is basically, you know, you go through life, you get married. It used to be you got married to, you know, the opposite sex. Now that's changing. Okay, but it used to be in America, you got married, you had a boy and a girl, you know, the ideal American family, you know, have a career, you live happily ever after, blah, blah, blah. Okay, that's the typical, even Christian mindset, world's mindset. Okay, but what if that doesn't happen? What if something in God's plan is going to change some things? Well, that's what we got to deal with. It's outside of our control. Okay, it's part of God's sovereignty. Okay, how about health issues? Okay, health issues that are not self-afflicting, but still health issues. Uh, how about a car accident? A car accident that affects you for life. How about that? That's a cross. That's a terrible cross, but it's a cross. And who's ever borne that cross? Boy, when they hit the judgment seat, I don't want to be standing by them because they had a terrible cross. Well, from our perspective, but from God's perspective, he said, boy, look at this, what I'm going to do for them because of that cross. How about uh, an unwanted or unexpected divorce? How about that? Oh, the brethren have a tough time with that one. You know, they want to always jam that down somebody's throat. How about the children of a divorce relationship? That I tell you, the thing that children have to go through, uh, it is unbelievable, the squabbling back and forth on that. And the children have a cross that they bear, and it's outside of their control. And a lot of the children will, in their own spirits, will say, I'm the cause for mom and dad divorcing. And that's not the case. But they'll carry that guilt. Okay, it's, uh, how about the rejection or the abuse of a parent? Okay, how about, I tell you, I tell you, our society is just gone nuts. I mean, the sociopaths, I don't understand a sociopath as how they can habitually lie right to your face and, and believe their lies. And then they're raising children. And children are putting up with this abuse when you got a divorce situation and a stepdad and a stepdad dad don't like the kids from the previous marriage because of the jealousy. And so he takes it out on those kids or he's perverse and he is a pervert with those kids. Okay, I tell you, that's the cross that goes against common sense of life. But that happens. Does it not happen? I tell you, in this country, in politics and Hollywood, pedophilia is rampant. I mean, it's just rampant. Uh, it's been reported that Bill Clinton himself flown 20 times to this rich guy's island, known pedophile, convicted pedophile, and they're uh, taking children there, and he's been on that plane 20 times. And the queen, she's done about seven or eight. Known pedophiles, child trafficking, you know, all this stuff I, I was just totally oblivious to. When I bought my uh, black Passat, went down to Texas, bought it down there off eBay, and the guy I bought it from, I said, what do you do for a living? He said, I'm helping recovering child trafficking. I thought, whoa, what is this? And he started telling me about it. He said, you don't realize how rampant it is. I didn't. I didn't. I didn't realize how rampant it was over in Toledo, Ohio, where a lot of kids are getting kidnapped over in Toledo, Ohio. And my, son, my five grandkids are over there. But that's this world system. And that's a cross that people bear. How about being betrayed by a friend? How about being ridiculed on the job? Okay, you know, you uh, speak up for the Lord Jesus Christ and guys on the job are going to ridicule you. You might even lose a job over it. How about the death of a child? Or the death of a loved one? 
Okay, how about the offenses of others or financial troubles? I tell you, there are people everywhere are hurting. Sadly, the common thing is hurt people hurt others. Okay, but it's, it's workers, people you work with, rub shoulders with. A lot of them are trying to keep these things hid. And you'll see them come in when they're down. And then if you ask them what's going on and they don't want to tell you because it's so bizarre. Can't tell you what that is, what's going on. I mean, I tell you, these are things that God allows to happen in a lot of people's lives. And, they, and a lot of people just don't have anybody that helps them bear it. The Bible tells us to help bear one another's burdens. Okay, now the thing is that the Lord says, take up your cross. Okay, it's outside of your control, take that cross up. And you know what? In 2 Corinthians chapter 1, when you take up that cross, that suffering that you've gone through in life, as you're carrying this cross, you're going to see somebody over there, their cross is just like mine. And if you've been getting some strength carrying your cross, you can kind of go over to that person and help them with their cross. Okay, and the thing is, is yeah, people are going to, they're going to spout off, oh, you need to do such and such. Okay, just ignore that, because this is something that God's allowed. It's outside of your control. Okay, now the second area is a denial of self. That is within your control. Okay, that is where we put aside some desire or eliminate it from our lives in order to personally help somebody else. Okay, for example, okay, I, I, you, know, you know, I built this log home. It took me 15 months by the time I cut the trees out of the woods and moved in. Okay, and got, could have got it done quicker, but obviously had the duties of the ministry. And so there are a lot of times where, yeah, I'd like to be working on the house doing this, but I need to be doing this because th- this is something needed in their life. And so I had to put aside my horizontal desire to help somebody, and that became a vertical desire to help God. That's a blessing to God. Okay, maybe you uh, got a goal to go someplace, and the Lord says, I want you to stop and help that person. You're on the side of the road. Now, ladies, you don't do that. You can't trust anybody. Okay, but if you're big and burly and you maybe got a knife or a gun on you, maybe you can help somebody. Okay, but still the idea is what you're doing is you're temporarily putting aside something in your life, your desire, in order to help somebody. That is something that the Bible obviously admonishes us to do. And when we do that, when we die to ourselves and we're giving ourselves to another, when that person lives for God, that's when you get a double blessing out of that. Okay, now let's pull this into the family realm. Okay, <laughs> parents, got a lovely little child. The little cute little thing is all about self, is it not? It comes in the world. That, it has to be. It can't talk to you. Okay, and so when it's grumbling about something, you got to check, okay, it's not the diapers, it's, it's not, it feels good in here. you got to try to figure that out. Okay, and so here we have an innocent little child that's all about self. And hopefully, by the time they go out to the world on their own, they're thinking outside of themselves. Sadly, that's not the case. Okay, hopefully they have realize, hey, the world doesn't revolve around me. (laughs) I know that's a shock to a lot of people, politicians especially. Preachers are terrible about this. You know, as far as they think the world revolves around them. Why? It's because everybody just comes up to them and everything. Okay, so we got a child. It was outside of their control that they were born into that family. Okay, that's God's will. That's how that happened. Now, as this child growing, growing, their mind starts to develop. They start feeling some independence here. And mom and dad says, you have to go to school. I don't want to go to school. You have to go to school. Or whatever method of education they choose. Okay? We're going to do it at home. We're going to do this. We're going to delegate it to somebody else. Okay? And now, that ch- what, what red-blooded American boy likes to sit in a desk 
when it's above 60 degrees outside. I mean, who likes to do that? That is not, that would not have been my first choice. You know, I'd rather go on out to the bar and throw the baseball up and let the Cardinals beat the Cubs again, as I usually always did back in those days. Okay, and so I'd rather do that or take my bicycle, take the wheels off, paint the bike, put it back, you know, put it back together, you know, and then go down to the big ditch that we have and jump off the high dive, which is about three feet, and into the ditch. And then I realized later that our septic system went down to the ditch and then, oh, well, that's kind of different. Okay, and so that's why that water is a little slimy at times. Fortunately, I swam upstream, so the slime was down further downstream. Okay, but yeah, any kid would rather do that. Okay, but why is he there? Because dad and mom say so. Okay, or some people think the law says so. Okay, now as that child gets older, they're going to feel their independence. Their wings are going to be flapping. And that's a natural thing. Okay, and by the time I was, uh, you know, 16, I probably stopped putting cootie things on my hands about girls. Maybe at 17, I don't know. I discovered that, you know, okay, maybe they're okay. Sure are pain, though, sometimes. Yeah, I was a late bloomer, very late. Thank God for that. Okay, and so uh, the, the children, they start thinking for themselves. And they think mom and dad is not as smart as they think. Okay, it is outside, teenagers, of your control for your parents. And they're going to have you do some things that you may not like to do. But if you bear that cross that God has for you, instead of hurrying up and trying to get rid of the cross so you can get out in the world and decide for yourself, and then make a royal mess of it. Any of us that have been in, old enough would know that from 15 to 25, we've made some whopper decisions. Wish we could do them all over again. Okay, and so here the kid in our culture, when he turns 18, he's a man. <laughs> okay, and so he's 18 years old, and one day, he may be 18 physically, he might be 12 mentally, I'm not sure about that one, but as experienced as an adult, he's one day old. That's all they are. And here they got this independence, and I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do that, and I'm going to do this, and mom and dad says, watch out. Well, I'm just going to do it because I want to. Yeah, and you're going to be held accountable for what you've done. Okay, and so you didn't think down the road. And it would be a wise thing if that individual would die to themselves to say, I am going to voluntarily yield to my parents' wisdom. Okay, that would be a wise thing to do. Okay, where... If you take up that cross as a child, take that cross up and submit to it, it'll make your life easier, make your parents' life easier, instead of bucking that cross all the time, because every one of us have had to do this in life. That's God's program. And then when we come of age and we hopefully stay, keep the communications open with parents, voluntarily, okay, then you have learned to deny yourself. And that's where God steps in and is really pleased with what's going on. Okay, so this denial of self, okay, this is, this is a joyous thing. This is going with mom and dad to see grandpa and grandma. And I want to see grandpa and grandma. Yeah, that's, that's part of life. That's honoring your parents. That's honoring them. I mean, Jan and I, but we'd go twice a year out to Pennsylvania to see Granny and Papa. And, you know, I don't know how many, it must have been a decade. We said, Papa's not going to live much longer. And he, he lived a long time. <laughs> but you never know. You never know. But it's honoring to your family. I don't want to go to the family union. Well, hopefully they're okay to go to. But if you got some pretty bad families, I wouldn't go to them. Depending on what's going on there. Now, in, Jan, in our side, in Jan's side, you know, Jan's side is on the Christian influence, which is nice. More on a contemporary, but still it's okay. Okay, but, you know, what kid wants to go to those things? A lot of times they don't want to, or sometimes they do, but that's your 
cross in life. And the Lord wants us to follow through. Okay, and so this denial of self. There are times you need to put aside your pleasure or time for the needs of others. You know, one of the judgments, and we portray it in the judgment at the uh, play, is the judgment of the nations. The judgment of the nations recorded in Matthew 25, Joel chapter 3, is honoring people, rewarding people who stuck their neck out for the righteous of the tribulation. It wasn't just that they gave them food and drink and visit them in prison. Okay, can you imagine visiting somebody in prison in the tribulation time period? Where this person's in prison, probably because they're reserved, they're Jew, they're probably going to be reserved for a uh, sacrifice in a, in a religious ceremony, and you're going to go visit them, you're going to be one of them, you are associating yourself with them, you have just put a mark on your forehead. It'd be like Corey Ten Boom, when she's helping out the Jews during the, that World War II. When them Germans found out, boom, put a mark on her for you. They're not only just helping somebody out, they are taking their life and putting it in somebody's hands. And so this is a big deal with God. They're denying themselves voluntarily, didn't have to do it, nobody forced them to do it, denying themselves to help out somebody else and the Lord's got a whole judgment for that. That's why it's important to deny ourselves to help other people. Okay, and so uh, it's a willingly <clears throat> putting aside, okay, if we're going to give financially to somebody, we're willingly putting aside some of our desires to financially help somebody out. That, the, that one right there, the Bible says, is everlasting righteousness. That goes against human nature. Denying yourself or death to yourself is never 100%. Never 100%. Okay, why? It's because we all have physical needs. Okay, our family has physical needs. Any father, any father needs to plan and prepare to provide for his family. The Bible says if he doesn't, then he's worse than an infidel. Okay, and so a lot of these Bible believers, well, I'm a King James Bible believer. Well, okay, do you provide for the needs of your family, physically, spiritually, mentally? Wow, I'm a Bible believer. Well, why don't you throw away your Bible and get you an NIV because that's how you're living. Okay, and so uh, our primary ministry of service, any of us, siblings, family, is your family, your brothers and sisters. If you can reach your brothers and sisters... Okay, if they're not in a church, if they're not saved, you do what you can. Obviously, you've got to guard your family. Okay, but uh, your family, Noah, he got his boys and his wife on the boat, and then they brought their wives. That was it. Why? Because family. Okay, and the Lord wants us to realize, hey, that's the influence you have. And how do you reach your family? The best way you reach your family is you shut up. Really, you shut up and serve them. If you're a boy, be the best brother you can be to your sisters. Do all you can to help them. When you get an opportunity to speak up, okay, take that opportunity. But depending on what, where you're at in the family tree, when I became pastor here, Within the first six months, one of the first things I, or one of the things I did, Ronnie Christie's walking out of the church, and I just said, hey, Ronnie, I said, I said uh, I'm still your kid, brother. Nothing's going to change. And when I come to the farm, they don't call me pastor. I don't want them to call me pastor. You can call me idiot if they want, but just don't call me pastor. Why? Because I'm the baby of the family. Okay, and that's my position God birthed me into. And I'm not going to take my finger and point at my brother's face and tell him he's wrong because he's my elder. Now, if he's wrong, that's between he and God. You know, if God allows me to entreat about some issues, even to my own parents, if you're going to talk to somebody older than you, you've got to entreat them. Never rebuke them. That's against Scripture. I mean, the Bible is an Oriental book. Oriental people understand this. We white folk, we don't get this. Okay, and so the idea is that 
our family, if we can reach to our family and try to do what we can to be a blessing to them. And I know they're going to mess up. We all mess up. And the thing is, is we do what we can. Okay, we do the best we can. The Lord Jesus Christ, when he's on the cross, what did he do? He looked to the Apostle John and he said, Behold thy mother. In essence, he was saying to John, I want you to take care of mama. I don't know where daddy was. He's probably dead. I don't know. I have no idea where dad was, his earthly dad. But he took care of mama when he was on the cross. He said, take care of mama. Now, that's, isn't that something to admire? That's what the Lord Jesus Christ is telling us. Okay, so there are some things in our life that's outside of our control. That's a cross that we've got to take up. Now, if it's inside of our control, it's something that we can die to ourselves to deny ourselves, that's within our control. Those two things we need to do. And then what? We follow Jesus Christ. We follow him. And that's when the Lord will be pleased with what, how we're living. Okay, let's pray. Lord, I do pray you'd help us to understand these ideas, and I pray that you'd guide and direct us. And Lord, there's, I know, a lot of hurt, harm, going on within the church, hurting people everywhere. And things that uh, here we are 6,000 years from Adam and it's not going to get any better. And Lord, it, it's a wonderful thing to see in your word that when we suffer for some things that's happened in our lives and it's not our fault, it's something that you've allowed, that increases our odds for a crown. That increases our odds for a crown. And we don't like to think about it here, but when we're in heaven, we're going to be glad for it. And Lord, all things do work together for good to them that love God. And I know that that's about the redemption of the body. I know that. But still, Lord, I just pray you'd help us to exercise our faith and to trust you, even when we're bearing our cross. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Okay, we're dismissed.